time was running out, the clock was ticking and it was thundering in our ears. And we knew that we didn't have time. We weren't going to get pregnant naturally. It wasn't happening. I became very obsessive about uh, finding help and the only conclusion to this fight would be for me to have a baby or, or, or death. It was, it was sort of clear cut, it was baby or I would die. People don't realise how painful and hurtful it is not to be able to have a um, own family. For as long as men and women have been practising the procreation dance, millions upon millions of couples have had to cope with infertility. Man lived with the idea that it was God's punishment, or at best, a wish from him that was not meant to be understood. Being childless was loaded with shame, and those cursed buried their life's great mourning in silence. The first man who brought the childless hope was perhaps the most unexpected individual of all. A mouse geneticist, a bold thinking researcher by the name of Robert Edwards. <laughs> <laughs> She's only just got back from school. Well, just got back from school? Yeah. yeah. When I started getting mouse embryos, mouse blastocysts, I began to think I could get rat blastocysts and rabbit blastocysts and cow blastocysts and human blastocysts. Those thoughts entered my mind because human reproduction was not understood at all. It was still semi-religious. All my work on chromosomes in mouse was now coming home, but now was aiming towards the human. So we had the hormones, we had the embryos in animals, we had experience with all these areas which was needed if we're going to go into human reproduction. And this meant I had now to get used to the ethics, because I had no question in my mind that the ethical battles would be immense. I went in with my eyes wide open. I, I knew it would come. At that time, the public became outraged when it was revealed that scientists tried to fertilize human eggs outside the body. I'm afraid to say, were two Nobel Prize winners who gave it the biggest problem, James Watson and Max Perutz, honoured people, honoured people, who said we get many abnormal offspring, we'd have to use infanticide, and so on. Now, those were terrible things to say. I think that James Watson has changed his mind now. On July the 25th, 1978, a human miracle was born. Louise Brown, the first test tube baby. At midnight, with the press men outside thinking we're gone to bed, we went back to the hospital, delivered ever Louise in secret. She, she cried after three minutes. Wonderful news, good lungs. And we've done it. From now, anybody in the world could do IVF. I'd just been doing a bit of normal infertility work at that time and uh, it was really more or less a shock that it was all of a sudden it was possible to do such an advanced technique. I myself was working on the surgical side of infertility and uh, and of course believe much, very much stronger in that. But when, when this happened, I immediately saw possibilities for a lot of patients that I couldn't help surgically. The race was on all over the world. Research groups in all Western countries competed in order to get ahead of the next to deliver a test tube baby. Australia was number two to be successful, closely followed by the United States. Sweden was the sixth country. It was a fantastic feeling to 
to, to see this healthy little baby and to compare it with a photo of a four cell embryo nine months earlier, it's still, for me, rather uh, impossible to, to, to understand that this little cluster of cells can develop into a, a human being. I put uh, uh, egg and sperm together and then I culture them in this uh, incubator and uh, I got the cleavage and also uh, the, uh, the embryos which we were transferred to, to, to the mother. And uh, so everything happened in this room. We had a lot of problems from the profession to, to, to convince authorities and political parties that uh, this was something good. It wasn't only what we wanted to do, it was also what our patients wanted. Because uh, through the mass media they, they got a lot of knowledge about the new possibilities and uh, they forced us. With IVF, in vitro fertilization, being childless became a medical complaint with possibilities to assist. Out of the strong longing for a child, a mighty power is born, which could lead to great achievements. When the weather gets better and I'm walking into the park and lots of children, buggies, all that side, it's quite painful. It was a strange sort of pain, a strange sort of sorrow that I've never felt before because I felt bereavement, which is extremely intense. To feel that kind of love that you do have for your own child, it's completely different to anything else that you can, you can't actually compare it to any other feeling in the world. The danger was not just that I would never have a baby, but that I'd end up being a woman who'd been eaten alive from the inside out, and I'd literally just be left as a shell of a person. We wanted, we wanted some purpose and meaning in our life, and children, we thought, would give us that. And, and to me, that's, that's the whole point of being a woman to be able to raise a family. And I think maybe women probably would seek um, help probably sooner than men, purely because that, again, that maternal pull is probably stronger than the paternal pull. For women, the test tube procedure means that her natural cycle is shut down and then recreated under the control of a doctor. The first part is doing the drugs, um, so you panic about getting the timings right so that you can start the drugs at the right time. And then you have to go through a month of constantly injecting yourself and taking drugs every day and, and trying to eat the right things and drink the right things and not drink and not do this and, and everything is, is so intense, it's so intense for that month. And then you have a two weeks of limbo, which is probably the cruelest, the cruelest thing anyone can go through. Because it's that two weeks where your body's telling you you're pregnant, and you are pregnant. Um, and then you have to wait those two weeks and have the test. In about 40% of attempts, the embryo attaches to the womb's lining and starts to grow. Six out of ten times, something goes wrong, and the woman starts to menstruate. I became pregnant on the first try, so we thought, hey, there it is. Well, probably need, didn't need to spend the money, but, but then I had um, early miscarriage. So from then onwards, I was, uh, I was nearly 41 when I had uh, my miscarriage. From then onwards, everything was absolutely nightmare. If you are pregnant, then you phone them up and say, I'm pregnant. They say, oh, congratulations and, you know, good luck, because... <laughs> because they know that the chances are is you know something's going to go wrong and I'm like a battery hen I produce tons of eggs so so doctors usually say well this is great this is a fantastic result and then results aren't very good in the end how come that so many eggs can actually be released in such a short period of time well every female infant 
is born with several hundred thousand immature eggs in her ovaries. Then when she reaches puberty, sex hormones are produced and the eggs start to develop. Normally just one of these ripened eggs frees itself from the ovary each month. Here Karl Lerfmann's unique pictures show the single egg just after its release as the ovary spits it out as it were. So instead of just looking for this one egg at some time during the day or the night, if you could use fertility drugs and have a number of eggs growing in the ovary and you timed when those were going to be released or when they were going to be ovulated, you had a much better chance of collecting mature eggs and a much better chance of forming embryos and hence pregnancies. And that's the way it turned out. The fears I have more than anything else are about what I'm doing to myself. So it's the drugs I'm putting into my body and obviously that's going to mean that my menopause is going to come a little bit earlier because as soon as your eggs run out and you know so and the drugs that you put into you there are fears of cancers and, and things like that so yeah I, I do think about it but it's not enough to stop me. It's, it's still that, that need for a child is definitely stronger. Whatever the, whatever the minimal risks there were to her health, and they were tiny, uh, it was worth it to, uh, to have a baby. One major complication with uh, IVF has been ever since the start, uh, multiple pregnancies. And this has caused not only twins' pregnancies, but also triplets or quadruplets or even higher order of of, of, of births with an enormous increased risks for these pregnancies, both for the uh, children and for the mother. The risk to die before or around uh, delivery here is a little bit less than 1%, but after IVF with multiple pregnancies, it's about double. And the temptation to replace more than one embryo to increase the success rate uh, uh, has uh, been prominent in uh, all over the world. The latest developments concerning the safety happens here, I think, in Scandinavia now, and that is the insight and the knowledge about the risks of multiple pregnancies. So now we insert no <coughs> only one embryo in the majority of women, which, which we didn't a couple of years ago. The key to success with single embryo transfer is to try and identify the most viable embryo because after the stimulation of a specific woman you usually have maybe six or seven or eight embryos and one of these embryos is possibly better than the others. By combining different techniques we have been able actually to perform this because the results shows that the effectiveness that we can see after one, after single embryo transfer is excellent, much better than we hoped for. There's one other factor though that we cannot influence and that is the factor of, of, from, from the mothers, the mothers to be, because these women, most of them have infertility problems. For example, they have pathology in their abdomen around the uterus, and this pathology does not go away with the treatment, it stays, which means that the placentation is less good, which means that there is a somewhat increased risk also for singletons of these women, and that's something we cannot influence. And I would say today, after the knowledge we have now collected, the answer to that question is no. 2003 marked the 25th anniversary of the Bourne Hall Fertility Clinic and Louise Brown, the first test tube baby. Also present were just a few of the over one and a half million IVF babies born around the world. Mamma mia! Don't show again! Mamma mia! 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 Mam
No. I just I think I'd be the same now as what if I was conceived normally. I don't think is affected me or anything. I just a normal. I was going to say teenager, but I'm not a teenager anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honestly, there's no word that can describe what I feel for my mum in that. Because there's, there's nobody else that I would know that would go through so much like pain and suffering and like trauma even at times to like, to try to have a child. She'll set a goal and then she'll always make it. Mm -hmm. Oh dear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Louise's birthday party is living proof of what no man ever thought possible. But then again, it's just a starting point. New questions are turning up and have to be answered. Where are the boundaries for how far man can cultivate an embryo outside of the womb? Does one need to go further? Maybe the increasing number of infertile couples is due to our stressful lifestyle, where the solution would simply be a change of ways. I think it has been obvious and it has been shown in many reports that lifestyle factors are more important than we may be thought. Obesity and infertility is a stronger factor than we believed only a couple of years ago. It turns out that body weight is a pretty strong predictor of infertility. The overweight is worse than the underweight. And what it does is that it interferes with ovulation. These women can be treated with medicine, but the success of the treatment will be much higher if it is preceded by a period where the woman tried to reduce weight. Well, I think we're heading straight into a genetic century. And there's no way to avoid that. And I, and I really feel that the, the people and the politicians and, and the lawmakers who are extremely restrictive in, in this area are really trying to stop something which in, in the future is going to be necessary. During the years I have been working with infertility treatments, it's about 15 years, my limits have been changing all the time. I had no doubt that genetic diagnosis, stem cells, chromosomes, infertility was a package that was bound to come. It was time for the man and his sperm to undergo examinations. If we go back 25 or more years, we didn't understand that that was the situation and it was commonly thought also among doctors, I think, that most of the, fee of the infertility problem was with women. Now we know better, we know that about half of the problems rests with, with a male. In 1990, in Belgium, scientists discovered cases where a man's sperm is so weak it can't penetrate the egg's lining. They discovered how to help sperm reach the egg's center. With a minimal sharp needle. The technique was called ICSI. So now we can treat almost any kind of sperm problems, or male fertility problems even to the extent that even men who do not have any sperm at all in their ejaculate, we can then extract single sperm from the testicle. The sperm you use is unable to fertilize otherwise, and we also know that sperm from infertile men have carry more genetic abnormalities than normally. So this is one of the reasons why we shouldn't overuse it, I think only use it when it's necessary. And we also inject that sperm together with a little culture medium and that medium con could contain things that is not so healthy for the egg. There is a slight risk for, for boys being born after the ICSI technique that they may have a slightly increased risk of being infertile themselves. 
which would be that they, that they, they inherited the problem from their father. A couple of hundred thousand children have been born uh, now, so we can say that the risks are not major. There's one exception more, and that there's a slight increase of something called hypospadia, that the penis is, is not shape normally. This can be corrected surgically, but apart from these, I would say, smaller problems, the truth is that the ICSID children do not have any increased risk compared to IVF children. The human egg become a money maker. It is bought, sold, given away or frozen down. To donate egg is now legal in England and Finland. Is it acceptable? Is it humane to have a sibling in the freezer, a bank of tissue for the future to be used in cases of diseases and emergencies? To freeze one's fertilized eggs at 25 years of age in order to implant them when it suits both romance and career? Women are working. Women are working later and longer and having, so, they're, so they're having a professional life before they actually have um, children. Well, why not? I mean, why should they be tied to the sink? Why should they be living a life of drudgery? What was the whole point of the 1960s if it wasn't allowing women to have the freedom to make choices about their professional life, about what they wanted to do with their life? And if science can help them out in that, well, great. You can preserve embryos or eggs uh, in young patients who, uh, who get a cancer and needs treatment for cancer before uh, getting pregnant. It may be misused uh, by young women who want to have their professional career first and uh, their children much later, um, that you can take out uh, eggs at the age of 20 and uh, preserve them till the age of 50, 55, 60. If you take young women in their 20s, the last thing that they're ever going to think about is to have some ovarian tissue frozen or eggs put aside. They're just not going to do that. I just know that they're not going to do that. Freezing of eggs is, uh, is very different to freezing embryos. The egg is a very unstable state when it's waiting for the sperm. Sperm enters it and it has to stop all the other sperm coming in. It has to receive the, the sperm. It has to change the sperm from a very tightly packaged uh, cell into a, a nucleus so that it can incorporate. It is, it is very unstable. It's set up. It's tense. I've sometimes described those eggs like hand grenades. They just easily go off. So if you put those eggs in a freezer, what happens is a lot of the systems break down. But what I do suggest to you is that, that we will learn one day how to make uh, eggs and sperm. And we'll make them through the stem cell, germ cell route. So if you happen to be 45 or 50 and you'd run out of eggs and, or, or your eggs really were genetically abnormal and, and, and not useful, then I think we could actually um, do something about that in the future for you. So providing you have a uterus, then I think you would be able to have a child because I don't see safe pregnancy developing in any other place but the uterus. Tracy had gone for another treatment and she just said, oh, they've advised me not to have any more treatment um, and to try something else, like surrogacy. And Maria actually asked me, she said, how did you get on, you know, at the hospital last time? So I, I started telling her what happened, the doctor sat me down and said, you know, try a different method. And I just sort of said, I could do it. 
I mean, she was really shocked. I just sort of said, oh, I'll do it for you, just sort of out of the blue. I was like, well, yeah, don't, you can't just say yes, you know, think about it, you know. No, I've been thinking about it, you know, it's all right, don't worry, you know. I've just been waiting for you to, like, throw in the towel, you know. And that was it, just started crying, really. Yes, me. And because I'd had easy births, like with Ellie, my last one, she was really quick. So I think that's why I, I thought, and pregnancy to me is easy as well. Well, I, I was overwhelmed by the, you know, by her actually offering to do it. It's because I knew it wasn't mine. That's, that's, that's why I could do it. I couldn't do it with my egg. But because I knew that it was Tracy and Armit's and I was just, just a womb, just carrying it, then I could do it. I thought that, you know, that's my baby in there and this wonderful woman's carrying it for us. Obviously, at the same time, because of all the disappointments before, still very, very tense that something may go wrong. Being gay is I don't believe it's being infertile anymore. Um, had the question been asked 10 years ago, and I would have certainly said yes, you know, we, as a gay person, um, I can't procreate a, ch a child, I can't bring a child in this world, so I'm infertile. We were, it, we never thought that we would be infertile. We never thought we would have a hard time conceiving. It was more of looking for the father. How do you know? <laughs> we looked into um, sperm banks and, you know, known donors versus unknown donors. And another friend of ours offered, I'll be the father. And it, it really made us think about maybe it, it would probably be a very important thing to have a father in the life of this child that we're bringing into the world. It crossed my mind that because of the fact that I was gay, that I would not be a, your typical family, and I would not have a child, and um, that's just the way it would be. And um, as I entered my 30s, I had more the urge of wanting to settle down and kind of establish myself in my community and become kind of involved in my community. And I felt that not having a child, not having a family, was going to put limits on that. And um, I had the urge, yes, I wanted to become a father, be there for someone. When we initially asked Jill to be a uh, father, we told him that both of us wanted to eventually carry a child, that we wanted to have more than one child, and that I got to go first. I said to myself, you know, if I agree to go with this, I'm going to accept the fact that they're going to be the primary parents, and I'm going to have, have to accept the way they want me to be involved in his life. And so it kind of just fell into place. Probably a month or two later we started actually trying. I wasn't thinking about the baby. I was thinking about Maria the whole time. She was squeezing my hand so much and I thought, how can this woman go through this much pain for me? And suffering, you know? There she is, the miracle woman. <laughs> oh, wonder woman. <laughs> a little angel. She's so red. <laughs> it's big, isn't she? She's got chunky cheeks. There she is, our little miracle. Her angel. She's given Her us, angel. you know, something what we've always wanted and she's given us life and it couldn't have come from a better person, you know, because she's she is a lovely person. I feel a lot of things. Maria's made me feel a lot of things, you know, she's made me feel like womanly again. I don't feel like all bad inside and that yearning, that aching, it's all gone. Shall I make you a cup of tea? I've done something good in my life, you know? 
can't when I see other people that, that can't, I think if, if only pregnancy was just a little bit easier, I would do it, you know? She's, she's just given us a lifelong time of happiness, hasn't she? Really, so much to look forward to as well. So she's made my dreams come true, Maria. I will have a family. Absolutely. No doubt at all in my mind. No doubt at all in my mind. Um, even to the stage that my sister has said that if I can't and it just completely goes wrong, that she will have one for me. That wish can be so strong that couples are prepared to, to take risks that we know and to pay a lot, a lot of money for the treatments. And that is fascinating because it tells me how urgent, how important it is with reproduction in the human being. When we first dis realized that we had a problem and we were joining the awful band of, the sort of awful infertile club that we dreaded, I imagine perhaps we, we'd, we had some money in savings accounts and straight away I just thought, well, let's spend it, five, ten, fifteen thousand pounds. Um, I don't know what, what the limit might have been, but certainly twenty-five thousand pounds, I think, we were prepared to spend. Um, ultimately, we might have remortgaged the house. Yeah, walking down the hallway with my cup was kind of strange, and... Uh, knocking on the door and having them open the door and handing the cup was kind of a little awkward. And, and then, like, when you get to the technical aspects of it, it's just really not that romantic. It's, you know. I remember sitting on, on, the, um, on the bed and I had a glass of wine. Kathy had given me a glass of wine. And um, I was sipping my wine and I was just kind of relaxing from my day of work and thinking about it. And I'm like, oh my God, this is really happening. You know, and we were disappointed when we found out that it didn't work that time, but but optimistic that it would that it would happen soon. Yeah, nothing, no, no, everything was just so pleasant. Mm -hmm. Not one bad thing. I thought, oh my goodness, what have I gotten myself into now? <laughs> now there's going to be a baby here, and this house is so small. And I kind of froze a little bit. I'm like, it's like, okay, wow, it's real now. What does that do? <laughs> Where's the cat? I started trying to get pregnant about a year ago and um, I just assumed it would be no problem. It, it was a little bit of a shock when I wasn't pregnant that first try. <laughs> um, and then the second try and the third try and it's been getting more frustrating with each um, with each try. Come here, kitty. Come here. Come here. I know that heterosexual couples, once they experience about um, a year of trying, they are welcomed into the IVF clinic and given all options pretty much made available to them. But the fact that I'm a lesbian and I um, have been trying with Jill you know, uh, artificially, they discriminate between that and trying naturally, and they don't offer the same services. Mm. All right, ready? Should I go dump it? Yeah. Okay. We have to pay for many of these procedures before they pay for the procedures. We have to pay for IUI. We have to pay for his um, samples to be tested and his samples to be frozen um, and stored. Um, we would have to pay for injections and all of these things for a year before insurance will pay for them. What are we going to do? Well, I, f I feel like that is a, an inequity in our system, that lesbian couples should be entitled to the same coverage as straight couples when they're 
trying to start their families and having some difficulties in doing that. As it stands now, I think Jill and I will try for another year. We talked about that since day one, how they wanted to establish a family and, and you know, have two children and Kathy and Daphne would both carry a child and, and they would really like it to be the same father. So there would, you know, there would be a, a blood connection between the two child. And I'm, I'm gonna do it, whatever it takes. I lived in Africa for quite a while and I've been in contact with many African mothers. Motherhood is such an essential thing for all human beings. But if you live in a rural area, in Africa for example, you have one specific role to play, that is to be a mother. I think we have to make it available also to this part of the world. Make it simple, make it cost effective, make it make low cost systems that can uh, deal with it. And this is actually possible. The 90s kicked off with a big number of researchers starting the project Hugo. The goal was to survey every human's genes. It led to the development of furthering the techniques called PGD or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. Now one was able to eliminate a fertilized egg that carried evidence of being sick genetically and even the possibility of selecting babies. PGD as a screening process not only to look into known genetical diseases in, in a family but uh, to help us to choose the most genetically healthy embryo to replace is no doubt on its way into the IVF uh, clinics. Uh, I think it can combine healthier children and no multiple pregnancies. The obstacles are that you cannot do it for all the diseases, that the success rate can be improved, and that it's, ex ex it's expensive because it's very labor intensive. You need highly skilled people. I, I'm, I'm supportive of some situations, like the, the Franconi anemia situation, where, where you have a sick child with a genetic disease, and if you if you want another child, if you can select one which, which, which has uh, tissues compatible to save the life of the sick child, I'm, I'm supportive of that. I would as a parent do that and I can understand that, so I'm supportive of it. 300 babies have already been born throughout the world with the help of this technique. Russian Yuri Verlinsky is the father of 200 of them. With working with nature, to help the nature and God, if you wish, to do his job. That's our things to do. I mean, that's, that's what we're doing. We're helping God to do his work. It can also involve a risk uh, that we uh, take away everything that is not perfect. An elitistic uh, way of, 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 of reproduction that we want to avoid. I'm not uh, supportive of uh, selecting genetically uh, embryos for intelligence or, or for, for other physical attributes or, or mental attributes. I think it should be restricted to genetic disorders. The question of sexing of embryos, to know whether it's a boy or girl, it's of course very controversial. I think if some diseases exist which are sex-linked, that is acceptable. But to do sexing just to fulfill your family structure, to wish for a, 
a child of a specific sex, sex is, is, at least in the Western world, very controversial and not allowed. But if you could sex select, then I don't see that that's a problem. And if you ask those people who had four boys and five girls or whatever, I bet you 100% of them would say, yes, let me choose, because I don't want to have to go through all that again. I don't think we designed anything. We just uh, do a diagnosis, and that's it. I mean, diagnosis was already designed by nature. And then to try to avoid tragedy, and that's all. You come to have this kind of new moral obligations once the techniques are there, because then we are responsible if a child um, has some kind of deficiency, uh, difficulties in reading and and, and um, no pitch, for example, no sense of good music and so, and it's my fault and then, then I'm the one to blame. We can treat some disease by using pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, so we can select embryo what is not only going to be normal, but also can produce stem cell by, from umbilical cord from, during, uh, after delivery, stem cells to treat sick sibling. There's a whole lot of embryos that have been put in the freezer that the patients do not want to use anymore. They don't want to donate them to other couples. They're prepared to use them for research and they're looking for uh, research prospects which are worthwhile. Now this is much better than forcing the patients to destroy those embryos. Um, from my own point of view and obviously from the Islamic point of view, um, I think stem cell research is actually um, a very important step forward in the world of science and technology to um, go on to help with the research um, of to cure diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. Um, as far as using the stem cells to go on to create embryos, um, that is actually forbidden. People are sceptical and that they are worried, um, as they were in the beginning with the IVF. I hear the same arguments now as I did at that time. And I'm sure this is the way it's going to go in time immemorial. But slowly uh, we will see the benefits of things and, and then uh, uh, the sense of it will prevail. If you think about who would really need reproductive cloning uh, uh, today, uh, you have difficulties in, 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 in finding such couples. Of course, if you have a man uh, in a couple with not a single sperm, then uh, he cannot reproduce. And that might be an indication for a small, small group. Cloning as an infertility treatment is something which I do not think is as necessary or even ethical. I feel that cloning cannot be done safely today. And, every, and very many prominent uh, uh, scientists are warning us about that. I'm suggesting to you that the future